that you were trying to say something else. As I hand out Bible study sheets, here's my question for you today. I just got copy, and my question is, how much creamer do you use? This has nothing to do with Bible study, by the way. <laughs> Let's just be clear. Uh, uh, so how many are straight black? Okay. How many are, I don't know, one thing a creamer? I guess I can put one here and move them all down. Not make you do all the work. <laughs> Woo! Usually it's only your wife that scoots away. Uh, that'd be my wife at least, right? Jeff, one of those for you. We'll pass the rest down here. You guys can keep them going that way. All right. So we're, we're, we got to one, one, one creamer. How many? Two creamers. How many three? How many five or more? You like coffee with your creamer? Okay. It was just a curiosity that kind of hit me this morning as I'm trying to have a infusion of stuff. And then some of you are like, nope. I only do mocha latte, cappuccino, blah, 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 blah. Um, I don't even know what those things are. Um, that's how that works. All right. We are in 2 Samuel. By the way, I just have to brag a little bit, humble brag for a second. Last night, there was a trivia thing at Sioux Falls Lutheran School. Okay, I don't know how many of you guys were there. Um, but one of the questions was, this was the capital of uh, David's kingdom before he moved the capital to Jerusalem. Anybody know the answer? Angie, what is it? Hebron. Hebron. Right? Which we learned last week. So anybody who was here in Bible study, I know got that right. So maybe. Or not. All right. That was just my little humble brag. But apparently nobody cares. And so uh, that is fine. All right. So we are on Second Samuel. And I started with chapter. Or I uh, I. I included three last week, uh, not knowing how far we'd get. We, of course, did not get to it. Um, uh, so uh, we are going into uh, uh, this. Uh, but let's kind of rehash a little bit because we're just in the early parts of uh, 2 Samuel. So what is the difference between 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel? And don't say a one and a two, please. <laughs> I know Joe was going to raise his hand for that one. Um, okay, 
2 Samuel. So end of 1 Samuel ends with Saul's death. And now we are in the portion of times where it's a transition uh, from the monarchy of Saul to the monarchy of David. Okay? Um, and, and it kind of bogs down a little bit here with details. Um, uh, maybe that's okay. Maybe you go, oh, this drives me crazy. Uh, either way, um, that's what's going on. All right? Uh, so in chapter 1, uh, we meet a couple of people. Okay? Uh, so Saul is dead. Okay? Um, his son Jonathan's dead. And so the last reigning person, or the last person in Saul's monarchy, okay, is a guy named what? Ishbosheth. Ishbosheth, which is just fun to say, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I, especially, um, Carson, do I see that you have a mouthful of Oreos? <laughs> Can you say Ishbosheth with those Oreos in? He's trying not to. What a nice guy. All right. Um, so, yeah, it's just one of those things that you cannot just help but spray Ishbosheth uh, everywhere. All right. So, um, uh, Ishbosheth, and, and Ishbosheth himself is kind of a, how do I put it? He's a weak leader. Okay. Um, uh, he's, he was never, uh, he, he's not like Jonathan, who, uh, if, if Jonathan had lived, was, was a mighty warrior and people would have followed him. Ishbosheth is weak. And so uh, the person who kind of props him up a little bit is who? Abner, Abner right? Uh, little Abner from Dogpatch. Uh, anybody know what I'm talking about there? Anybody under 50 doesn't know what that is. All right. Um, so uh, wasn't there a cartoon, Little Abner and became a play and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, anyway, all right. So um, Abner is this uh, mighty warrior. He is the uh, Saul's bodyguard. Um, and so he kind of rallies the troops around Ishbosheth, okay? Um, and, and he props him up on the throne, okay? And then out of that comes this battle, Um where David's guys seem to get together with Abner's guys, and they're two different countries, Judah and Israel. Um, and, and, and it's not exactly clear how it happens. Maybe they have some sport or something, but ultimately it turns deadly. Um, Abner's troops lose, um, and, and, and that kind of moves us into chapter 3. All right? So we're going to read a whole bunch of verses, verses 1 through 25, to kind of get this section in one complete thought, okay? Uh, so did I open with prayer? No. I am sorry. Let's do that first. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for the weather that you have given us lately and the beauty of your creation. We ask you to help us to not worship your creation but to focus and worship you and you alone. Help us to be in your word that it would strengthen our faith as we study uh, David's life today and through our Bible study. Uh, we would ask you to help us see uh, how you are encouraging us uh, to be men and women of faith as your son David was. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so we're on chapter 3. Verses 1 through 25, here we go. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And David grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. And sons were born to David at Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam of Jezreel. And his second, Chiliab of Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And third, Absalom, the son of Machah, the daughter of Talmai, the king of Geshur, and the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Hagrith, and the fifth, Shepatiah, the son of Abitai, and the sixth, Ithrim of Eglah, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. 
while there was a war between the house of Saul and the war uh, in the house of David, Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Ritzvah, the daughter of Aiah, and Ishbosheth said to Abner, "Why have you gone in to my father's concubine?" Then Abner was very angry over the words of Ishbosheth and said, "Am I a dog's head of Judah?" To this day, I keep showing steadfast love to the house of Saul, your father, to his brothers and to his friends, and have not given you into the hands of David. And yet you charge me today with a fault concerning a woman. God do so to Abner, and more also, if I do not accomplish for David what the Lord had sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah. From Dan to Beersheba. And Ishbosheth could not answer Abner another word because he feared him. And Abner sent messengers to David and he on his behalf saying, "To whom does the land belong? Make your covenant with me, and behold my hand shall be with you to bring over all of Israel to you." And he said, "Good, I will make a covenant with you, but one thing I require of you, that is, you shall see my face. You shall not see my face, unless you first bring Michael, the son of uh, Saul. Sorry, Michael, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face." Then David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, "Give me my wife Michael, for whom I paid the bridal price of a hundred foreskins of the Philistines." And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband. Paltiel, the son of Laish. But her husband went with her, weeping after her all the way to Bahurim. Then Abner said to him, Go, return. And he returned. And Abner conferred with, conferred with the elders of Israel, saying, For some time past you have been seeking David as king over you. Now then bring it about. For the Lord has promised David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. Abner also spoke to Benjamin. And then Abner went to tell David at Hebron, all Israel, that Israel and the whole house of Benjamin thought good to do. And Abner came away, came with 20 men to David at Hebron. David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with him. And Abner said to David, I will arise and go and will gather all Israel to my lord the king that there they may make a covenant with you and that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away and he went in peace. Just then the servants of David arrived with Joab from a raid bring, <coughs> bringing much spoil with them. But Abner was not with David at Hebron for he had sent him away. And he had gone in peace. When Joab and all the army that was with him uh, came, it was told to Joab, Abner, son of Ner, came to his king, and he has let him go. And he has gone in peace. Then Joab went to the king and said, What have you done? Behold, Ab Abner came to you. Why is it that you have sent him away so that he is gone? You know that Abner, son of Ner, came to deceive you and to know you're going out and you're coming in and to know all that you are doing doing. We'll stop there. All right. So the previous events, meaning the events that we saw in chapter two, this war between um, uh, the house of Saul and the house of David, right, uh, continues to go. Uh, for in David's perspective, how's the war going? Good. Yeah, the, Dave, the war's good. Um, uh, Abner continues to lose men. Uh, David maybe loses men, but not as many as Abner. Um, uh, so it's a good thing. Um, verses 2 through 5 give us this interesting um, list, if you want to call it. Maybe a micro-genealogy of sorts. Um, what do they indicate about how things are going for David? He's got a lot of wives. Why does it bring that up? What, what, what does, in, in, in this time frame, and again, we're not justifying having many wives. It's not what we're saying. But 
what does it convey? Power. Power. Strength. Um, uh, prosperity. Um, uh, because in this case, you're feeding uh, not only these women, but the kids that they have. Um, and, and, and so uh, you are able to do that in some way, shape, or form. Right? Uh, so I think in this... I can't remember, but if you count the numbers, it's like six uh, wives that he's up to. We were at two uh, earlier while he was still moving around. Um, uh, those two are the ones, obviously, that have the first kids, but then uh, it looks like he adds several on uh, to this. Now, some of these are coming from treaties that he's making with other people, right? Uh, but for whatever sense... Uh, it gives you a, an idea that uh, things that are going well for David. Life is good, okay? Meanwhile, what's happening in Saul's house? I have a question about David. Okay, you can have a question about David. Uh, did he have more children than just these six? Um, okay, so I think two things that are going on. Um. He will have more children, okay? Um, even as I read some of these children, uh, they don't jump off the page. Like uh, some of the first ones, you, you, you remember their stories from later on. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that later on in 2 Samuel. Um, but um, realize what's going on. Saul's house is falling apart, okay? Um, right now there's Ishbosheth. You're not seeing any sort of kids coming from Ishbosheth, so therefore there's no successor, right? Which is a sense of power, a sense of, uh, of, of fruitfulness. All those things are in it. And on the other hand, well, what do we have? We have David, and he's got kids popping out left and right, <laughs> okay? Um, and, and, and so uh, the idea is, he is being blessed. He is being fruitful. Um, that there are successors that his kingdom is establishing. Okay? Um, so certainly there will be more ki kids. Uh, he reigns over the throne 40 years. Um, uh, he, he, he certainly, um, well, if nothing else, we know Solomon will come into this picture uh, later with Bathsheba. Right? So there will be more kids added to this. Um, but again, you're just seeing kind of this fruitfulness picture. But I think this is why it's established here, right? Meanwhile, in Saul's house, what's going on? It's not Ishbosheth that's gaining strength. It's not the house of Saul that's gaining strength. It's Abner, okay? Um, and, and, and how does this work? How is it that Abner is gaining strength? You guys know this. He's the military commander. He is the strength behind the... One guy's got the title, and this is the guy that's behind the scenes that supports the troops that everybody really follows. You know what I'm talking about? Um, and, and, and so um, what's the problem that happens? What does Abner do? He sleeps with a concubine. What does that mean? Yeah, so th th there's a piece here. Um, and, and, and if you go back um, uh, into Genesis, uh, you see the same kind of stuff, right? Um, uh, so that um, when somebody sweet sleeps with his father's concubine, uh, you are making a move on the headship of the house, okay? Uh, so this happens with, I'm trying to think, is it Reuben? Uh, Reuben sleeps with Jacob's, uh, like, oh, what are the two? Everybody knows Rachel and Leah. Uh, Bilhah and Zilpha, and Zilpa, and he sleeps with one of those two, all right? And Jacob's still alive. And, and Jacob gets mad at him for this reason uh, because he is making a claim to the head of the household, right? Uh, so Ishbosheth 
goes, hey, wait a second. I'm the king. You're the commander. You don't do this. Is he right? If Joab had done this uh, with one of David's many wives, and he had plenty to spare, right, um, what would have happened to Joab? Yeah, right? Um, uh, but Ishbosheth raises this, right? How does Abner respond to this? I think everybody can bully Ishbosheth. Uh, uh, Ishbosheth is kind of like my golden retriever. Uh, uh, he, he's a nice guy, but, you know, man, other dogs. Uh, w when they come around and pick a fight with him, he like rolls onto his belly. Um, and you're like, uh, so when we were gone a couple of weeks ago, uh, my sister's chihuahua picked on my dog uh, and he was scared of him. Um, true story. Um, you know, it just is what it is. He's three times the size, right? Um, that's Ishbosheth, right? Um, and, and, and so Abner, as the big dog in this, gets offended. And Abner says, fine, I'm taking my toys and I'm going home. And all of a sudden he loses his support for Ishbosheth and he pulls that, right? And so you see this strain between Abner and Ishbosheth uh, that Abner just does not respect Ishbosheth at all. Okay? Maybe he doesn't deserve it, right? But whatever reason, this is what's going on. All right. Uh, so uh, Abner in verses 12 and 13 goes and, and he pulls his power play. What is that power play? That's right. He becomes Monty Hall and he says, let's make a deal. <laughs> right? Uh, hey, 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 David, uh, uh, Ishbosheth's being a chump. What are you going to give me? Right? Um, uh, what if I join forces with you and now Ishbosheth's gone, right? Um, what is it that David wants in order to make this work? Michael. Michael. However you pronounce this, right? Um, uh, right, Michal, Michael. Yeah, it, it's all in the same root, uh, same meaning. Um, who is Michael. Okay, Saul's daughter. Okay. He's also wife of Jacob. Kind of, sort of. So here's the deal. She's the gal that David uh, won. This sounds so romantic. He goes and he gets, uh, for the price of, a hundred foreskins of Philistines, uh, of which he doubles and pays 200 foreskins. Uh, he was supposed to get Michael and Saul reneges on the deal. Okay? So she never quite becomes his wife, but she's owed to him as his wife. Okay? And all of a sudden, David pulls this out. Why is this a big deal? It's another power play. Because you're now married to the, you, you have ties to Saul's line. It's a claim to the throne. Okay? So we don't even know if, if, if David is romantically interested in this lady at all. That ain't the point for David. Okay? Point is, he's owed it. He's deserved it. Right? And it needs to be paid. And so Abner says, Sure. What's Ishbosheth say? Ishbosheth can't say anything because <laughs> he's Ishbosheth, right? So he goes and demands uh, from uh, the uh, that Michael be uh, given over to David. Uh, she's already married to somebody else. Uh, that poor guy gets his wife ripped away from him. Um, and, and see, so there's all sorts of problems with this, right? Um, uh, who knows what the right thing to do here is? Um, uh, but but um, uh, she is given over to David. Um, and, and, and what does Abner then do?
Okay. So, so Abner um, uh, says, you know what? Uh, I'm going to fulfill the house. Uh, so Abner kind of becomes this um, kingmaker, if you will. First he builds up Ishbosheth, then he rips him down, and he says, I'm going to build up David. All of it's on Abner, right? Um, so Abner starts negotiating in good conscience with David um, uh, to come over to his side uh, so that all Israel will be united among, around David, okay? Um, and, and, and so then you get this weird little thing at the end. Joab comes home from a, a raid. And Joab finds out that Abner's there. And how does Joab like that? He doesn't like it. Why doesn't he like it? He doesn't trust him. There's more to it. Okay, yes, Abner would be a rival because you have these two guys who are uh, big, burly warrior types. Okay? definitely part of it. But what did Abner do to Joab? He killed his brother. Now, we can say it was kind of accident, uh, but whatever it was, you can see how there's some unresolved issues here between Joab and Abner. Okay? Um, uh, they get set up. All right? Uh, two warrior guys, and how do warrior guys handle things? Yeah, warrior-wise. So that takes us to the next part. Maybe? All right, here we go. Starting at verse 26, When Joab came out from David's presence, he sent messengers after Abner, and they brought him back from the cistern of Sirah, but David did not know about it. And when Abner returned uh, to, Hebner, to Heb Hebron, uh, Joab took him aside in the midst of the gate to speak with him privately. And there he struck him in the stomach so that he died and for the blood of Asahel, his brother. Afterward, when David heard of it, he said, I and my kingdom are forever guiltless before the Lord, before the, uh, for the blood Abner, of Abner, son of Ner. May it fall upon the head of Joab and upon all his father's house, and may the house of Joab never be without one who has a discharge or who is leprous or who holds a spindle or who falls by the sword or who lacks bread. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, killed Abner because he had put their brother Asahel to death in the battle at Gibeon. <laughs> then... David said to Joab and to all the people who were with him, tear your clothes and put on your sackcloth and mourn before Abner. And King David followed, uh, followed the bier, and they burned Abner at Hebron. And the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept. And the king lamented for Abner, saying, Should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, your feet were not fettered. As one falls before the wicked, you have fallen. And all the people wept again over him. And then all the people came to persuade David to eat bread while it was yet day. But David swore, saying, God do so to me, and more also if I taste bread or anything else, till the sun goes down. And all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them, as everything that the king did pleased all the people. So all the people and all Israel understood that day that it had not been the king's will to put at, to death Abner, the son of Ner. And the king said to his servants, Do you not know that a prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel? And I was gentle today, though anointed king. These men, the son of Zeruiah, are more severe than I. The Lord repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. Okay, so you have this nice plot going on. What, what does Joab do to Abner? Okay, he kills him. There's so much more here. This is, the, I mean, yes, he kills him. But this is, this is along the lines of uh, uh, Caesar and Brutus, right? This, this is um, uh, calling him back while he's on the road. And so he 
comes back to talk to David, and, and, and Joab pulls him aside. And while he's got him aside, he, he gives him a couple of quick ones to the gut and, and, and kind of leaves. Um, uh, so uh, it's more dirty, it's more underhanded um, a, a, as part of this. Um, why does he do it? Vengeance for, for his brother, okay? Um, and, and so if you didn't pick it up earlier, this is the place where you see it. And so you see all this. I mean, this is Game of Thrones before there was Game of Thrones. Um, uh, you, you see all this underhanded political stuff uh, that we're doing still today in a whole different way, depending on what TV show you watch, right? Um, but um, why is David upset about this? I mean, really, ha having Abner gone, in some ways, is a good thing for David, right? This is a guy who's a powerful guy, uh, who, who the people of Israel would be following. He's a kingmaker. In, in, in some, some ways, it does benefit him to have Abner out of the picture. But is that what we see with David? No. No. What do you see? David always lived by the motto, you don't lift your hand against the Lord's anointed. Okay. Yeah. You have this, this, this uh, uh, thing going out. Right. Um, keep that in mind because that'll really come into play in chapter four. Now, Abner's not the Lord's anointed. He's just a mighty guy. But there is a place where does it say something about Abner or does it say something about David that I, I, here Joab goes out and he calls him back. And, and, and who are people thinking Joab's working for? David. Right. So. So when Joab betrays Abner, what is the thought in everybody's head? David sent him to do it. He's the hatchet man, right? This is the guy that carries out David's dirty work. And so there's a place where this reflects on David, okay? Um, and, 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 and David's very concerned about this as king because this is not his identity. This is not the kind of king he is, right? And so David consecrates a fast. He mourns Abner's death. This is not just empty. Um, uh, he, he really mourns this guy, right? And what does it show people? He is an orderly. Yeah, this, is, this is not on David. This is people under his orders are not under his orders. Is people under his authority who are acting outside of his orders. Um, and he tries to make it very clear, uh, that distinction, that these are wicked guys. And, and uh, again, the writer of 2 Samuel, all right, uh, is making it very clear to distinguish <coughs> between David, who is this man after God's own heart, and Joab, who, well, what is he? Yeah, he's just a, he's a warrior, a commander of people, uh, but he's not necessarily working for the Lord. He's working for Joab. Okay, um, so you see this distinction coming out between these guys, and this will ripple throughout the relationship between David and Joab. All right, so we're just kind of getting the early parts of the story here, Okay. <laughs> Uh, what words does chapter 3 close with? Looking at it. And I was gentle today, though anointed king. These men, these sons of Zeruiah, are more severe than I. The Lord repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. How's it end? There's kind of a sense of that. There's a sense of um, uh, these are wicked men. Yes, they work for David, and that is still the situation. Uh, he doesn't go and kill Joab because of this, but it's establishing this relationship between them, and Joab is going to get his. Okay.
These chapters are quite bloodthirsty. How should the people of God respond in situations like this? It's a little more open-ended. Not that any of us are kings. But in situations like this, right? Yeah, right? And this is the place where, where, where we keep seeing this, this sense of uh, who David is, that he's trusting the Lord to take care of things. Uh, 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 even when there are problems happening. And what does that mean for us? Maybe just maybe that same Lord who took care of things, who repaid evil for evil um, uh, uh, for David, um, will be the one who judges and <coughs> executes judgment on people and not us. Because that's not our role. Which, man, we so want to do, don't we? I don't remember. One of my boys I was talking to about forgiveness the other day. And the hard part about forgiveness is what? It's part of it. But why do we hold on to it so much? Do people actually wrong us? Yeah. Sometimes they intend to do it. Sometimes they don't intend to do it. Doesn't matter. Right? But why do we want to hold on to it? Because we like control. Because we like the feeling of holding that over them because it makes it feel, makes us feel better or superior. That's the challenge in all this. Right? Rather than to just trust the Lord will take care of this. I don't need to get revenge. Um, you know, and so here, here are places where m maybe we're not dealing with, you know, a couple of gut shots um, and, 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 and things. Uh, but you can definitely see Joab takes a different approach than David. Right? And, and, and there's encouragement that, hey, Maybe we can trust the Lord the same way David does. So far, so good? Okay. Let's go on to chapter 4, and we'll see this uh, ripple out a little bit more. Okay? Um, so we'll read verses 1 through 12. I saw the word Ishbosheth and went 12. All right. Anyway. Uh, when Ishbosheth, Saul's son, heard that Abner had died at Hebron, his courage failed. And all Israel was dismayed. Now Saul's son had two men who were captains of raiding bands. The name of the one was ben Bana, and the name of the other was Rechem. Sons of Remen, a man of Benjamin, home from Beeroth, for Beeroth also is counted as part of Benjamin. The Beerothites fled to Gitaim and have been sojourners there to this day. Jonathan, a son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the news of Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled, and she fled in her haste. He fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth, which is almost as cool as Ishbosheth. <laughs> All right. Now the sons of Remon and the Berothite, Rechab and Bana, set out, uh, and about the heat of the day, they came to the house of Ishbosheth as he was taking his noonday rest. And they came into the midst of the house as if to get wheat, and they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rechab and Bana, his brother, escaped. When they came into the house, as he lay on his bed in his bedroom, they struck him and put him to death and beheaded him. They took his head and went by the way of the Arabah all night, and brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron. And they said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. The Lord has avenged my lord, the king, this day on Saul and on his offspring. But David answered Rechab and Bana, his brother, the son of Remon the Berothite, 
As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity, when one told me, Behold, Saul is dead, and thought he was bringing good news, I seized him and killed him at Ziklag, which was the reward I gave him for his news. How much more when wicked men have killed a righteous man in his own house, on his bed, shall I now require his blood at your hand and destroy you from the earth? And David commanded his young men, and they killed them and cut their hands and feet and hanged them beside the pool of Abron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the tomb of Abner at Hebron. All right, nice bloody stuff. Sorry. Uh, now that Abner's dead, what happens to Ishbosheth? Okay, we'll get to that, but in verse 1. Yeah. So all of a sudden, your strong guy's out of the picture. And you go, uh-oh. Right? No general. He's gone. I'm a target. Um, and, and, and so he kind of wimps out, heads home, and, and, and kind of sets up a fortress to protect himself, a bunker, if you will. Um, uh, but, but, but essentially... He's not ruling anything. Uh, with the power vacuum, you don't have Abner. You, you kind of don't have Ishbosheth. We're introduced to new, two new characters. Who are they? You get like three verses on these guys. Bana and Rechab. And you get all sorts of information on them. Other than they're from Benjamin, uh, uh, it, it's a lot of whatever. Okay, um, so, so they're going to favor into this, but they seem to be um, uh, people who have access to uh, Ishbosheth because of what? They're soldiers, and they're soldiers on his side. Okay, now we get another character. All right, who's this new character? Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. He'll come back into play too, right? Uh, what do we find out about Mephibosheth? Okay, he's Jonathan's son. What does that tell us? He has a claim to the throne. There's a problem with Mephibosheth, though. What is it? He's crippled. What's the problem with that? It's a weakness. In a land where the king is the mighty warrior, the guy who can't walk so well, not a mighty warrior. And so there's a place where um, that verse almost gives you a sense that um, Mephibosheth is there, but he doesn't really have a claim to the throne. Nobody's really going to follow this guy. Okay? Um, moving on. Story goes back to Banna and Rechab. What did they do? <laughs> Joe, what do you got? I have a question. Why do they keep stabbing the guy in the stomach? <laughs> well, no, I mean, they cut they off his head, too. Well, I know, but it's a slow death. If they wanted to kill him just to sort of abort this thing, you know, try to get the heck out of there. But if you stab someone in the stomach, you've got to lay there in agony for a while and, and kind of die slow. Is there something behind that, or is that just the translation that they have? Wow. <laughs> Have you ever considered writing a commentary? Sorry, I, I the, Joe's commentary on no, I'm 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 not. Um, that's a that's an interesting level of detail that the commentary didn't highlight. Okay, but you do have a point. Okay, it's a gruesome death. Okay, um, when when I think of stabbing in the stomach, I, what I really think of is. Sneaky and underhanded. Okay? I don't dwell necessarily on the type of death, the agony that goes with it, other than uh, it's disguised, it's, it's underhanded. Um, uh, in in Ishbosheth's case, um, uh, they stab him while he's asleep. Okay? Um, so this is, either way, it's gruesome. How do you feel about such an act? Is 
Is it justified? Is it not? We'll get to that. But even if it's not the Lord's anointed, um, is there a reason to kill, especially like this? Vengeance. Okay. So we went through the Ten Commandments this morning. We didn't get to the Fifth Commandment. Right, I, I only focused on the first one, but it's in there, right? Um, are there reasons it's okay to kill, especially for vengeance? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will exact for my Ah, there we go. So the struggle here is, you know. I, I, I just wrestled with this idea of, um, and, and it happens even in the United States, right? I don't care who you like for presidential candidates, right? But is there a reason to assassinate them? Even if you disagree with their policies? Even if their policies are evil and affecting you in an evil way, right? I, I, I mean, this is all part of this. They're not necessarily the Lord's anointed. I'm not going to make the claim that uh, Joe Biden currently or uh, Donald Trump before him or Obama or Bush or right uh, any of those um, is the Lord's anointed. Okay, I'm not going there. But it still says in Romans that they reign because God permits them to reign. Okay. So you see a difference here, right? Uh, uh, that there is a place where the government is established as an authority to protect you. Um, and, and, and that when this kind of stuff happens, wow, maybe maybe this causes us to check well, well, what is our, our, our role, what is our responsibility as, as, as Christians. And I, I, I'm not answering that. I, I just want you to, Ask that in your head. What, is, what does this look like? So after doing their deed, they travel all night to David with Ishbosheth's head. Gruesome, right? Uh, what did they expect? Right, this is a reward. This is what kept going through my head as I was doing this. Why does this feel like when your pet brings you a dead baby bunny in the yard? <laughs> well, they're you ever have that happen? It doesn't matter if it's a cat or it's a dog, but it shows up with this dead baby bunny and presents it on the stoop and says, here you go, and you look at it and go, they're proud, and you're not. Right? Is that what David feels like when he shows up and they've got Ishbosheth's head? Right? They're proud of it. Hey, David, look what we did. We did this for you. And what does David recall? He recalls the events we saw in chapter 1, where the, not the armor bearer, but the uh, a messenger gives him the message about Saul and he might make it up and embellish it to make himself look better in front of Saul. And David does what? He kills the messenger because he would dare strike the Lord's anointed. Okay? Now you have two guys who have actually killed the son of Ishbosheth. Or, sorry, not the son of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul. They've uh, dared to put her, their hand against him, right? And, and they're looking so, for some sort of attaboy, some sort of praise. And he's saying, this is even worse. Because you did this in an underhanded way. You set your hand against the guy who was, at least you understood to be your anointed. So what's his response to these two saviors? What happens to him? off with their head, 
right? Uh, what's interesting about what David does with Ishbosheth's body? Uh, his head, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, that's my fault. I don't have anything witty on this. I just found it interesting. Why are we burying Ishbosheth's head in Abner's tomb while Abner was betraying Ishbosheth? If anybody has any comments in their Bible about this, I don't know. I, I just found it curious. I don't know what it means. Um, I just found it interesting. Okay. Um, what results does this mean for David? Oh, go ahead, Jeff. One would think. It's, it's a very odd situation. Yeah, was he respecting both in the sense that um, uh, Ishbosheth is laid to rest with some sense of honor, like Abner, Abner like they were co regents? Uh, who? I'm sorry? Uh, Abner would be number two. So he, he threw number one in number two, too. They didn't feel like that. Yeah, like I said, it's an odd thing. I, I, don't, I don't have anything. Um, none, of the, none of the commentaries that I saw highlighted this and, and, and explained it. Um, but it's just, it's this odd little thing that caught me off guard. So I don't know if it's respect or disrespect, uh, but... It, it, it did catch me off guard, okay? Um, so maybe I shouldn't have brought it up, but every once in a while uh, you get the thoughts that are going through my head, <laughs> all right? Um, what are the, ultimately at the end of the day, by the time we finish verses 1 through 12, what does this mean for David? All of the competition is gone. Has David taken a part in any of this? No. David hasn't instigated it. David isn't fostering this. But uh, at the end of the day, weirdly, through the evil acts of other people, God is blessing David. Okay? Uh, uh, and, and I'm not saying God caused these things to happen. This is the evil way people do things, right? Right? Um, but God is using them, uh, are using their evil actions, uh, uh, and, and David is not participating in them, but they do end up blessing David. Okay? So, uh, uh, we have five minutes left. I'm not daring going on. Um, that finishes off uh, on 12, right? Um, so I'll pick up on chapter 5 next week, um, which really gets into, all right, now David gets to be king um, and, and what that means. Um, but this is the transition that's going on, right? Um, uh, so David is, is no longer um, the competition for, for the throne is no longer out there. Um, go ahead, Ken. I just wanted to add before the end here, I mean, I had to go all the way back to 1 Samuel 16. The competition was never there. Awesome. God chose David and told Samuel, go anoint David from, or not David at that point, but somebody from his house. And that was way back in 1 Samuel. So, I mean, everybody knows David's going to be king. Everybody's working their own angle to try and get as much power as, as Ray said earlier. And that's fantastic. And we're talking about who's, who's at fault or why David's so good at the end. But, I mean, it happened way back in 1 Samuel 16. Yep. Yep. So yep. No. Um, uh, the, the other part that highlights that, listen to the comment that these guys make, right? Um, when they say, your enemy. Uh, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life, David never refers to Saul as his enemy. And that's what you're talking about. Um, uh, David doesn't view Saul in that way. 
Um, he's not competition. David's trusting that he'll become king whenever because God said it. Um, and, and, and yeah, there's all this evil and manipulation. And it, it, it's quite graphic in this. But Saul is just trusting. Um, uh, he, he is trusting the Lord to take care of it all the way back to 1 Samuel 16. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Thank you for correcting me. Um, uh, but yeah, um, and, and, and that's, I don't want to dwell so much in the gruesomeness. I mean, it's, it's there. But really, the, the point there is, uh, uh, David becomes a model to us uh, of what this trust of God looks like. Trusting him to handle things. Um, uh, to take care of us through it all. We've all got crud in our lives. Okay? Um, and, 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 and that's the piece uh, 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 of just saying, um, the Lord promises me that I'm his child and that he's going to take care of me. I don't know how that's going to happen. And oftentimes we get worried and we fret over that and we... Maybe it's just me, but I fret about it, and I want to control things. And it's the people who control things who end up taking each other out. And David just kind of trusts that the Lord's working in the midst of it. And yet David doesn't do nothing. David lives also in the world as a fantastic ruler. Absolutely. Working with faith, but also working with wisdom, knowledge as a worldly king yep. to do things that help his people. Yep. He mourns for those people, his enemies, because that brings the kingdom together. So it's it's living in the two worlds, isn't it? Living in faith and living in the world. Amen. I couldn't sum that up better, so I'm just going to leave it. Um, <coughs> all right. Any other questions? All right. With that, let's close. Let's stand up and close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great day.